tonight. With me, I'm Clemens. I'm a tarot reader, a psychic reader, a numerologist, and that's the work I do. And I also lead workshops on developing your intuition and um, things like body types and other met metaphysical subjects. The idea for tonight's talk came from it being quite close to Valentine's Day. And I thought, well, why not take a look at what the tarot says about the whole subject of love and romance? Because I think it's a subject that, for better or for worse, preoccupies most of us most of our lives. And as a tarot reader, I have to say that it is the number one subject that people come and ask me about. Uh, with Mike, you also read, aren't you? Would you agree? Yes, 95%. Right, <laughs> okay. Um, the only other subject that comes anywhere near it is career. Uh, and I would say less than half of people come to me and ask me about career. As Mike here says, who's also a very, very uh, fine tarot reader, about 95% of people ask about relationship. And they always want to know about it. Maybe because they're women. <laughs> Uh, but I also think if we had as many men as women, I think it would be pretty much the same. What do you say, Richard? You're a tarot reader too. Well, I, I don't think men are so interested in it. They, they feel that, you know, it's sort of beyond their control. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Richard said that um, he thinks that romance is men take romance to be beyond their control. So they allow it to, I presume, allow it to blossom or whatever. So tonight I'm going to be asking, well, is it, is it in our control or is it out of our control? And what does it mean to be in love? And what is the point of this preoccupation with, with love and romance? What does it mean in the bigger picture, the bigger scheme of our, our lives? Because um, what I'm also fascinated by is the concept of duality and non-duality, and how our life changes radically when we stop seeing ourselves as a dualistic phenomenon, as a separate being from you, or you, or you. And instead, when we start seeing the, the other side of the coin, which is everything, life is just everything happening around <coughs> us, and we have no individual separate identity within that all and everything. It's a very hard area to put into words, but I'm going to um, tackle it more visually in tonight's talk. So that will kind of take the pressure off trying to verbalize what is essentially uh, indescribable in words. So the whole, the whole thing, the whole title tonight, Tarot and the Lover, the Illusion of Duality and Choice. Maybe it's controversial to say that duality is an illusion because it's the world that we know. It's the world that we live in and go about in every single moment of our lives. We're faced with duality. Me and you, us and them, light and dark, good and bad, and so on and so forth. It's all duality, and the tarot reflects that. If nothing else, tarot is a, a duality engine. It just keeps turning up opposites, and we're going to look at those all through the talk. And in that sense, it does reflect life. But what I'm saying is that it's only the surface of life. Okay? It's only the, the mental appreciation of life that sees things dualistically. Um, so what I'm saying is that it's, a, it's, it's an illusion, and it's more than an illusion. It's a prison. And the jailer <coughs> is... Guess who? It's ourself. Yeah? That's the whole point. Duality is a prison in which the person who thinks they are individual puts themselves squarely in the middle of that prison with, with the key of belief in that, in that identity of an individual doer. And yet, freedom is so close to us. Uh, and well, we're going to see why, visually, using, using the tarot. One of the reasons that um, 
we're so locked in this game of duality, which I call an illusion, is the emotion that goes with it. We are addicted to our emotions, particularly in the area of love and romance. And for better or for worse, we cannot stop playing that game of going with the passion, going with the desire to be with someone, to, to go out with someone, to sleep with someone, to live with someone, and also the other side of it, which is all the conflict and all the uncertainty and all that clinging and hanging on and waiting and hoping. I mean, I get all of this every, every time I go to, <coughs> to a psychic fair and have all, all, all my clients come to me asking me, when am I going to meet the one? <laughs> What's he going to look like? Um, how long till he turns up? What about the, per the man I'm already going out with? Does he really love me? And, and do you ask yourself questions like these? Um, does, it, does anybody ever ask themselves questions about romantic, you know, uh, maybe you're pretty much on the way to enlightenment, yeah? Um, but so many people do ask these questions and I think that um, they could be so much happier. We all could be happier if we weren't so identified with whether or not it's number one is going to appear out there. So, what we want, my contention is, is freedom. But can we get freedom within the, the whole game of duality? Which is shown to us in the sixth card of the tarot. Yes, it's number six. And it's called, in the, in the original tarot, it's called Lamarillo. Which uh, is a rather strange spelling of the lovers, of the lover. You can take that to actually, in another way, if you did with, with French, the French language, you could take it to mean l'amour et un, the lover and them. Which is rather interesting because um, what does, who is, we have to ask ourselves then, who is the lover in this card? Yeah? What, what exactly is going on? We're going to do that. This card also shows us uh, the fact that it's a group of people and they're each playing a different role. And that role playing is, is essential to this whole subject because when we get out, of the, get out of identifying with the role that we play in the game of love, we almost, we almost in, a, in, a, in, a, in a twinkling shatter the whole illusion of duality. And when that happens, that, that fragile edifice comes tumbling down, as we see in the alter ego to the lover card, which is the tower. Uh, and it's number 16. That's why it's the alter ego. They're both six cards. In the major arcana, <coughs> there are 22, uh, 22 archetypal images. The lover is number six. Tower is number 16. So the, t the, the, the two sixes make the alter egos. And number six, the flip, you can call the alter ego the flip side. And what number six wants is number 16, <coughs> the other side of the polarity. There's a union here and there's a disunion there. But you can also take that to be freedom, freedom from the prison of duality exactly what number six, literally, number six, that's what he was called in the cult TV series, The Prisoner. I will not make any deals with you. I've resigned. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Superb television series. I think perhaps the greatest words ever spoken in a TV series, those ones. <coughs> and yet, absolutely, totally ironic, because at the very end of that series, in episode number 17, he comes face to face with his jailer, number one. And number one is number one. It's himself. He sees the face of himself. Yep, all along. Here is the, um, the, the polarity made clear between the lovers and, and the tower. The tower is that, that, that gel of um, duality. Uh, but it's, it's 
it, it's uh, crashing down and it's liberation, we can call it from, from a fixed position, breaking out of duality, original, narrow confines, as opposed to the outer reality of involvement and union with other people in emotional, social, or romantic roles and relations. So what we've got here is a duality between the outer and the inner. And one of the things I'm, I'm saying in this talk is that we all have an outer life and an inner life. And being in prison uh, isn't our lifelong destiny. An imprisoned person in the other <coughs> book than the tarot, if he knew how to use it, could in a few years acquire universal <coughs> knowledge and would be able to speak on all subjects with unequal learning and inexhaustible elo eloquence, said Eliphaz Levi. So he was in favor of this idea of breaking out of some kind of prison and having access to a tool, a tarot, namely the tarot, which will enable that, that liberation, will enable us to liberate ourselves. And we discover that all along what we were seeking, that liberation, that freedom, is exactly what we already are. And that is uh, unquestion unquestionably um, represented in the tarot. It's, it's not a fanciful interpretation because the first and the last cards in the major arcana, number one and number 22, are these two, the fool and the world. The first one, the fool, freedom of doing on the outer level, going out into the world, having experiences, meeting people, achieving or just traveling, constantly moving into the unfamiliar and the new unattached to the outcome. That is really the, 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 the highest, purest meaning, perhaps, of the form. And it's an outer level meaning, because the whole of the, of the, of the, the, the first half of the tower is about our outer lives. The second half is about our inner life. And it concludes with this card, the world. The meaning can be said to be inner freedom of being. Enjoying being okay with whatever is as is. And it's, it's rather ironic actually because the destination of the fall, of the seeker inside all of us, has nothing to do with ourselves. It's about elimination of the ego. In the world, there is, there is no mention of the person who the fall once was. It's simply the world. And that, for me, is the ultimate liberation. There's no more angst about me, my place, what do people think of me, how good do they think I am, am I doing well enough? It's simply life, the world, life happening. And whatever does happen inside, we're okay. We're, we're, we're fine just exactly the way things already are. Yeah? We're not judging it. And that is the ultimate realization that the fall, um, the fall discovers after his trekking. But, my goodness, is it a trek? Okay? And it's our own um, panoply of experiences in life, which is represented visually in these cards. Here they are. These, these, that's what a natural Tower de Marseille looks like. But there, there we have the whole lot, all 22. The fall at the, at the beginning, the world at the end. But it is not a journey. I don't want to go back into the Jungian uh, paradigm of a journey where the first half is seeking and the second half is retiring within. Or any kind of um, ex uh, experience related to time. Yeah? If, if oneness means anything, it has nothing to do with time or, or distance or space. Yeah? It even transcends duality. And when we look at these, these cards, what we've got here is a range of dualities, polarities, which to some extent are dualistic. They, they do reflect each other. They do stand at opposite poles of experience. And yet, the more we consider them, the more they merge, and in fact even become interchangeable. So this, this gets us thinking, how real is this so-called dualistic world? 
is it really so dualistic? And that's what I'm saying. The tower brings, when we consider things, and we have this blinding revelation, there is no so-called uh, dualistic world out there, based around the separa separation between I and them. <coughs> the ego personality, the fall, it explores all the illusory dualities of doing and being, until he comes to the understanding that he only is that which he is seeking. The realization of the world dancer is that her path of destiny was laid out and traveled by source all along. She understands there's nothing to do that is just to be. That's why she's dancing. She hasn't got a care in the world. Because to her inner self, everything is just fine the way it is. Yeah. But can we all live that way? Yeah. How far are we from recognizing that that is our innermost reality? How far do we actually feel that? Not only in our outer life, but perhaps even much more importantly in our inner life. Um, the experiences here, um, on the lower level, what we've got is what you could call the materialization of spirit, which is the world of matter. Most of the images have historical or social connotations. Okay? This is, the, this is <coughs> beginning with the, with the um, magician, number one, and he goes up to number ten, which is the wheel of fortune. Um, and you've got king and queen, you've got a pope, you've got the love of the chariot. It's all about going out into the world, like we've all got to do, to make a living, to uh, get along with our fellow beings, <coughs> to balance our, our karma, our, our doings and our, our, our acts, um, and to create, you know, to, to be, to be uh, good householders, as Gurdjieff called us. On the upper level, we've got the inner inner life. Okay, now maybe it's a bit controversial, but it's how things used to be in the ancient world. The the, the earth was seen as the the active principle, the outer principle, the material principle, and the he heavens were seen as the opposite, the spiritual principle, the cosmic principle. Uh, and nowadays, I think it's more common to think in terms of Mother Earth and Father Heaven, but this is the other way around, how it used to be in Africa and ancient Egypt. Okay? So, uh, the heavenly side of life is the inner side, our inner life. Uh, is, there, is everybody here familiar with, with the idea of having an inner life, mm. as opposed to an outer life? Yeah. It, it's a Gurdjieffian principle. I wasn't really so clear on this until I started, started studying Gurdjieff about 20 years ago. Um, where it was made abundantly clear that we have this inner life um, all going on all the time, whatever happens outside of us. But I want to say immediately that this is still duality. Our inner life is not our innermost core, which is something completely different. But it is something that you can call opposite to our outer life, and there you have it, symbolized in the yin and yang symbol. The outer life, sorry, the inner life is something, something dark and to some extent unconscious, certainly not so known to other people. And we can take that to be the dark side of the um, yin-yang symbol. The outer life was the light side. And the deeper you go into the dark, the um, closer you come to a realization of, of the, the opposite. So that's why you have the white dot in the, middle, in the deepest part of, of the, the dark area, and vice versa, the black dot in the deepest part of the white. Same thing in tarot. As you, as you move along the material side, to, towards the end, after having gathered an immense amount of knowledge and experience in the material world, guess what? You come to the hermit, which is the opposite of going out in the world. It's retiring. Yeah? So I've done that interchangeable with the two arrows with the sun. And again, the sun, shedding all that light and knowledge and enthusiasm and friendship with others, sharing it, is really the opposite of what it means to go within. And it occurs towards the end, at the deepest part, if you will, of the inner side of life uh, of living, of being alive. So I find that quite, quite stunning that we have that, um, that parallel between the tarot <coughs> and the yin-yang. Framing the whole thing, of course, 
We've got the fold in the world. What I seek is what I already am. None of this is necessary. None of this is real. It's all a game. Yeah? Because at the end of the day, there's only life. Some of these experiences, looking at them in detail, you know, just showing the strength. Yeah, that's a polarity there between um, having our ability to create and manifest and what that ability, where that ability emanates, where it originates. Um, on the inner level, it's our, it's, it's our life force energy, if you will, which can be wild, it can be uncontrolled, it can be untamed, and there you have it being very gently tamed. Energy that is raw, wild, to, ready to be channeled into outer use. Outer use, potential for initiating work and creativity, developing our skills. If you don't use it, you lose it. So, high priestess and the hanged man. Now, this is all about the feminine side, the moon-like side of life, um, being receptive, being open to, to knowledge in the way that a priestess or a nun would be on the outer side, devotion to sacred ideals of femininity, study, spiritual purity. And that is complemented on the inner side by the, the inner life of going with any perceived obstacle in our life and allowing it to be there and allowing ourselves to be okay with stagnation, with non-activity. If you only had the, the inner, the hang man, without the high priestess, there's a danger that you would have somebody who was just a slob, just a couch potato, who, who, who was apathetic and indifferent. But that, that polarity with the, uh, the priestess creates the, the opportunity and the uh, instinct to, to develop something from passivity to develop an inner maturity that the High Priestess symbolizes. The nameless of our karma, uh, does it remind you of something else? Something in particular? Death. What? Death. It's often called death in, in, in the, in the um, um, modern tarots. In, in the ancient tarot, it wasn't given a title. It is complemented by the, uh, the Empress, um, which is a way of, the Empress symbolizes nature and all things that grow by themselves, thanks to the forces of, of nature, um, and also that have their season of, of, of seed, of, of sprouting, of, of blossoming, and then of stagnating and dying. Um, hence the opposite card being the death card, if you call it that. And that is like saying, all that lives must die. Have it. And whatever is, whatever grows naturally will have a cycle of life. And that, that will bring it full circle to the end of its life where it then must begin again. So outer is create expression of creative life, natural fertility and abundance. So inner, inner is, the, uh, is the clearing and harvesting for transformation new growth. So it's, it's allowing the cycles to gently fall away and let it let them go. <coughs> it means a major transformation. If you get the death card in a tower reading, it's not it's not gonna mean you're gonna it's not meaning you're gonna die. It means radical transformation has has come along in your life. The Emperor Temperance, that's another polarity. Uh, this this one is all about the man-made side of life being balanced by allowing things to happen by themselves. Uh, outer systems and structures of man-made control and stabilization balanced by inner mixing of uh, opposite tendencies. Uh, not forcing your will over much, but allow, allowing what wants to happen to happen in, uh, in a natural way, in a spiritual way. This is one of the most interchangeable polarities. Uh, and it's the Pope and the Devil. And uh, on the outer, it means receiving guidance from a, from a teacher uh, on, on any principle, higher principle of living. 
of the teacher or spiritual authority. On the inner, we've got the devil, passion and temptations, taboos and unconscious impulses. A lot of our creativity comes from the um, from the what's the, the uh, that side of Luciferic side um, of the devil, um, but also our, our greatest fears and temptations, and also our greed and our violence and um, our inconsideration, our inhumanity to our fellow creatures. Um, and certainly in the Middle Ages, we saw a complete upside down of this, where the priesthood became the persecutors of the, uh, the men's and women and uh, the people who live um, outside the cities um, <coughs> following the wisdom of nature. So uh, quite a stunning reversal of that polarity. And in the end, opposite poles merging really. The star and the chariot, charities about going out in the world, achieving what you have to achieve, getting a job, becoming successful, making a pile on the stock exchange, building a large house, acquiring Mercedes, and a large family. And the inner is about uh, nothing to do with material acquisition, but simply returning to life, to the world, to the planet, your own humble, service-oriented energy, returning fluids, as she's doing, pouring them back into, into the river. Um, and knowing your place, not having to go anywhere or do anything, just being content to live a simple, humble life. Again, um, very much on, on a uh, scale uh, with the, uh, on the other end of the scale, but merging um, with the chariot, because uh, there has no meaning to going out in the world to earn a living if you, you never return home. It's meaningless, isn't it? Just to be working, working, working. Justice in the Moon, uh, here is about uh, justice being uh, very male-oriented, fixing of laws and standards, whereas the Moon is about being receptive to, uh, to, the, to the light of the sun, reflecting <coughs> back anything that comes into the, into the subconscious, um, to do with dreams, fantasies, and the unknown. Stuff that can't, can't be measured. Um, here, here we come to the reversal of the, um, the, the light and the dark in us. Uh, the outer is the hermit, but actually becoming the inner, because he's the hermit, he's retiring into retirement from the solitude. And the outer, sorry, the inner becomes the outer. The sun, which is about basking in the warmth, shared happiness, friendship, um, awareness, uh, material reconstruction. That is an inner, that's a card of the inner plane which has turned upside down and become the, the joy of Nirvana, of um, Satori, you know, when all that inner meditation suddenly breaks out into, into a complete oneness with everything around us. And then finally, the whole both cycles finish with the idea of um, it being another spiral of the cycle of life, a vertical spiral. You've turned out, outwardly, you've, run, you've, you've gone through the gamut of life experiences, and you're ready for a change in fortune. And on the inner, you, do, you not only have gone round in a circle, you've actually elevated to a new, higher level of consciousness. The, uh, the lover, when we come to the lover stage in life, it's usually in our late teens, adolescence after we received our, our schooling, our education. So it appears as number six in the, in the material cycle, after the, um, the, 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 high, the, the Pope or the Hierophant card, the heroine receives an education. So then the love, she meets a young man and falls in love. Yeah. And after that, number seven, she leaves home and starts a career. But I'm not so interested in, in, in seeing tarot as, uh, as a temporal description of our life. I'm more interested in um, understanding the deeper layers of meaning. And if you go into one, any one card, you suddenly start discovering layer and layer and layer of 
deeper and deeper meaning or in possible interpretation. The lover is a fine example, a very complex card, and you start looking at it in, de in depth. You've got a group of people, uh, so straight away we can say it's about union, about togetherness. But then we have to ask ourselves, is it about togetherness with other people, you, me, and everyone in this room? Or is it about togetherness of our inner selves? Uh, Goethe has called them eyes. Everyone has millions of eyes for, for different tasks and thoughts and feelings. Is it about that kind of togetherness? Then it's about our feelings, uh, emotions running high because of the human factor. Then it's about choices and the choices that we have to make to, to please other people, to, to do what our heart wants to do or what we should do. That can create a uh, dilemma for us or even conflict. So now we go from love to conflict. What exactly is that lady's hand doing on that gentleman's shoulder in the middle? Is she, is she restraining him? Is she holding him back? because he wants to go out with her daughter and she's not allowing it? Or is she encouraging it? Is she pushing him into that, like Miss Havisham with Pip and, and Estelle? Miss Havisham wanting Pip to f uh, f become smitten with Estelle so that Estelle will break his heart the way her heart was broken in the beginning of Great Expectations. What exactly is going on? All kinds of choices, possible scenarios there. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of role playing going on here, romantic and social. It could just be a social occasion, it could be fairly innocuous. But the characters are still playing roles, if you agree with Shakespeare that, that uh, all, our, all our life is spent on the stage uh, and we play many different roles. Finally, we have to consider that this card isn't, isn't just about the three, three characters below because I've missed out what's happening above them. You've got the sun there, painted white for some reason. And you've got Cupid, or um, Eros, firing an arrow. Uh, now, in the tarot, the tarot of Marseille, the colour scheme is very, very um, conscious and precise. Uh, so that's not a no accident, the sun is white. Throughout, throughout the, um, the arcana, white is the colour of the highest spiritual being high spiritual awareness. So we can kind of put two and two together and say that this isn't perhaps an, an outer sun. It's more something to do with something within us, a sun that radiates from, from deep within. Um, and as the card is called the lover and then, if you interpret it that way, we can say the sun is the lover. It's not none of these people at all. It's that, side, it's that aspect of life that loves unconditionally. Um, and its messages are brought to us. They arise, they arise in our surface vehicles of emotion and thought and intuition via those arrows shot by Cupid, who's the messenger of the sun, who we can call source, the source consciousness, which makes us what? Puppets. Yeah. That's very uh, not, not uh, flattering of the human condition that we're all puppets of something larger than us, but I think it's a valid interpretation. There we have the um, six pointed figure in sacred geometry. The, the lover is not a six card, and the six pointed star is uh, a very common and powerful and respected um, and meaningful symbol. It's used by the Theosophical Society along the road, centre of their uh, quest. It's a star daily on the flag of Israel. Um, it occurs in the Tripura Sundara Yantra. At the centre of that, that Yantra, we have the schema, scheme of the master plan of manifestation two interlocking triangles. And at their centre, you have an invisible white dot which are actually made visible, but you shouldn't be able to see it, which is the creator, the creator principle, the source, if you, if you like, uh, of all that is. Uh, the, the two triangles interlocking, they also occur in the, the centre of the 12 petaled lotus, which is symbolising the... Um, 
Destroyer. It's out of order, but it's symbolizing the heart chakra. <coughs> it's called An Anahata. It's the heart chakra. And um, it's interesting that uh, we're talking about love all the time. And those triangles actually appear over the heart in the, in the ancient symbolism of the heart chakra, um, which is all about balance and compassion, and also passion and unconditional loving and giving. So uh, those triangles, now we're going to spend, uh, we're, going, we're going to go into the meaning of those, those triangles uh, in, some, in some depth because I think that they relate very much to the games of love that we all play, particularly um, the roles that we play. And those roles can be configured on the points of those different triangles. And when we become aware of the roles that we play, we can become less identified by, by those roles. <coughs> so the intermesh triangles are the interplay of inner and outer, constantly seeking balance. The, the upper triangle, sorry, doesn't make any sense to say that. The triangle with the four face pointing upwards is known as Shiva, which is the materialization of matter into spirit. And if you like, it's that first, um, first row, that lower row of, <coughs> of symbols in the tower about the material life. Um, then you've got the, uh, sorry, that, that's, I've got that the wrong way around, sorry. Uh, it's a triangle pointing down, which is the spiritualization, which is the materialization of spirit, which is the, 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 the material row of the tower, which intermeshes with the other triangle, which is Shiva, okay? The upward pointing triangle is Shiva, downward pointing triangle is Shakti. And um, the upward pointing is our inner life. Downward pointing is our outer life. Okay? Truth flows from the source, which is right at the center, invisible, our inner sun, out into our emotional choices and unions, out into all our outer life and all our inner life, which are those points around those two triangles. The center point is our innermost essence, if, if you can identify it as anything. It's truth, it's source, it's the absolute ultimate principle, it's the one doer. The inner and outer life come into balance when we see center and allow truth to flow. So, so that center point also equates with the sun that we saw in, in another card. Um, it is all and everything, it's beyond description, it's, it's on a different level to our outer or inner life. It, but when we, are, when we allow truth, come from that invisible center which is within us and, and completely boundless without us, when we allow truth to just be, our inner and outer life come into balance by themselves. And that is what everybody is striving for according to the, to the ancients, to the Hindus, when they use this symbol. That's the um, place of the heart chakra amongst the, the seven, the seven main chakras. The um, uh, star we're looking at, the six-pointed star, has a three-dimensional form called the uh, star tetrahedron. And uh, that, that's been shown to fit around the, the, the human, human body, the body of the energy system. That's the drawing by Leonardo. And um, superimposed is the star tetrahedron, which has strong energetic um, significance. It's actually used in uh, the macabre, working with the human macabre, counter-rotating fields of light. One pyramid turning clockwise, the other rotating anti-clockwise. When you work with these, you are able to access higher dimensions. So this is the uh, again how 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 significant and symbolic this this structure, this three-dimensional star is of the human the human being. It also tells us, um, according to a Chinese saying, <coughs> that it's best to be receptive on the inside and active on the outside. So um, if we look at the receptive triangle, which is the one pointing up, okay, that's the, uh, that's the Shiva triangle, what that means is on the inside we have no preference. We're choiceless. 
we go with what is, as is, not attached to the outcome, soft, open, okay, the spiritual teacher, or John the writer, who always used to hold up, up his hand and say, are you like this, or are you like this? Yeah. So um, that's about being receptive, and in equanimity is surrender to what is, as is. I, I don't think that's all of life. I think life is also, what I'm saying here, is that life is, is, a, is a polarity of the surface. And on the surface, the opposite of the inner is the outer, the active, which is about doing. It's about uh, manifesting truth from within, outside in our life, but without any attachment to the outcome. Responding from our innermost essence, being passionately present, and fulfilling the purpose, not of ourselves, but of whatever life wants. Um, and I think that, sh that Chinese saying, has anybody come across that saying before? No? Never heard it? No. Okay. It goes very well with the, the beginning and the end of the, of the major arcana. Choicelessness, sorry, uh, doing on the outside the fall, venturing forth into the world, going forth from all kinds of experiences, open to anything, and um, the opposite uh, being the world, knowing that everything is fine, just exactly as is. Those two triangles have been uh, also a fixture of the Christian theology. The Christian hex alpha, which places Christ at the top of the, of the inner triangle, <coughs> with the Father and the Holy Spirit down below. It's called the Holy Trinity, which is uh, reflected by the unholy Trinity, which is um, the Antichrist at the bottom, and uh, polar opposite to Christ, um, with the, with, the, with the other points of the triangle being Mary and the serpent, the temptation going on there. So that is all about choice and um, temptation, which keeps us so, so locked in this dualistic paradigm, which is not real. Christ also appears in polarity with Faust in, in the mythology of um, having to choose between good and evil. Um, the devil carried Christ out into the wilderness where he had to spend 40 days and 40 nights and be tempted um, to become the king of the world. Uh, and in the end, um, he rose above all the temptations of Satan, pushed his way and said, get thee behind me, Satan, that um, uh, thou, art, thou art not for God, something like that. He had to choose just the same way as Faust had to choose between God and Mephistopheles, um, who is Satan. And he offered Faust anything he desired. Um, and Faust succumbed. Bless him. Yeah? He became what I'm calling here the split person, as opposed to the decided person, Christ. Doesn't matter where you are, this is all life experience. Sometimes you won't know what to do. You will be given a choice. And it's got to be yes or no. Are you, are you, are you going to go for the job or are you going to leave it? Yeah. Are you going to marry me or desert me? Yeah. And when we face with a choice like that, we are only human. We can be undecided. We can, we can mess it up. Maybe Christ messed it up. Believing that we have to make a choice. This is the point. Like that between good and evil heightens the illusion of self and the grip of duality. Can we be in a dilemma? In, in a rigid, in, in, a, in a do or die choice on the outside while remaining equanimous on the inside. And this, that's what this is asking us. Same thing uh, in, on both sides of the equation happens in the, in the Lord of the Rings with the um, two characters who are really at opposite, opposites to each other. Frodo, who is the Hobbit, who is charged with carrying the ring to its destruction to save the world, or Middle Earth, and Gollum, who is the uh, being who calls the ring his precious and covets and cherishes it like nothing else. He actually started out as a hobbit, you know, as a good hobbit. But he, became, he became poisoned and drowned in, in this covetous desire have the ring because it would give him power, all power. 
the one who can resist uh, the power of implicit in the ring is the um, is, is Gogo. So I've placed him at the top there because he's he's a decided person. Yeah? He knows that he's got to carry the ring and he's got to get rid of it and not be tempted by it. I say he knows, but towards the end, even even the innocent and pure Fogo has his moment of truth where he's tempted. Um, Gollum has no choice. Gollum just succumbs completely to his dark side, to the Antichrist position there. Um, so now, there we have a representa diagrammatic representation. How many people know the story of the Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Is anybody totally unfamiliar with it? <coughs> okay. <coughs> Not many, only one. Okay. So uh, the choice, the choice in someone in, in that position of the triangle is is always between one opposite and another. Uh, one side is commonly perceived as virtue, and the other as vice. Vice and virtue. How do you choose? Your head tells you, I've got to be, vir I've got to be uh, virtu virtuous. Yeah, I've got to do the right thing. But your heart tells you, I'm so passionate. But I'm so passionate. I want this. I, I can't stop myself. And, and, it, and it drives you in the other direction, towards sensuality, towards passion, towards vice, even perhaps towards evil. Okay? We've got the choice between good and evil, which is one of the main themes in, in the Lord of the Rings. Gollum, unfortunately, is drawn to serve, uh, drawn to cover the ring as evil, and that is um, his name. That is that is when his name becomes Gollum. Previously, he was called Smeagol. Smeagol was the, the Hobbit who was okay um, without being without being um, identified. <coughs> very clear split between two people in one person. Thank you, welcome. Sorry. That's all right. There was lots of traffic. Thank you for, for arriving. The split person is conflicted inside and outside because of temptation by desire. But also because of attachment to the income, to the out, the income. <laughs> Freudian slip. I may attach to mine. I've hardly got any. Okay. Right. So if we go on, um, we see Frodo, who is who is in the in the more, what we could say, the more comfortable position of the, of the decided person. He can carry the ring because he's decided about his destiny. He's liberated about it being his destiny. That's a very important point. Because if he's truly liberated, he realizes that he's not the one in control, that he's not the one pulling the strings. There's a greater um, uh, life, there's a greater force that, that, that's really in control. And that makes our life so much easier. It takes the, um, it takes the, the uh, how, do you, how do you call it, the, the emphasis, the, the burden off our shoulders, and we have to get anything right. So it's much easier when you know that. Whatever, whatever happens will happen because of life, not because of you. Because source is in control. But how, my, how difficult it is to remember in the passion of love, of, um, of a triangle particularly. It's older, uh, Trist and Tristan, that's one of the, the basic love triangles in, 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 in mythology and, and history, um, storytelling. It's older, feels forced to choose between two men, the love of her, her husband, King Mark, and Tristan, her suitor. Her non okayness of what is, as is, increases her division between two poles of attraction. So she, that places her down here at this uncomfortable split person point um, of the, the six pointed star. Same with um, Guinevere in the legend of uh, King Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot. Guinevere sometimes is portrayed as weak and opportunistic down here, at the bottom of the split person triangle. An adulteress who betrays her husband, King Arthur, for Lancelot. But 
not where she is down there. But sometimes she's placed up there, depending on the storyteller. Sometimes she's portrayed as a virtuous noble woman, true to Arthur, but preyed upon by Lancelot. Who is the intruder in this triangle? The intruder comes in from left side, an apparent predator, to take away the love object, who is, who is in this case, Guinevere, the innocent, who is the beloved, from her husband, in this case, uh, King Arthur, who becomes a rival to Lancelot. So this is the, the complexity of, of the love triangle that can suck us into identification with our role in that triangle. Inside, is she free from conflict? Only if she's free, uh, say the, the, the mystics, only if she's free from personal needs or wants. It is they that, that keep us trapped in, in a conflict. What we need and what we want. How many people have need, have, have, think they have needs? <laughs> Me, certainly. Um, how many people are driven by those needs? That's another question. Driven on the inside by those needs and by those wants as well. Maybe we all are. None of us are home. What the enlightened people call being home is when you no longer are addicted to those wants and driven by those needs. Where everything is, is, is serenely okay on the inside. Staying with the triangles and the roles that we play um, and different stories in popular culture. Um, we've got some very good examples in the classic movies. Casablanca up there, Sabrina down here, Gone with the Wind, um, and on the right, The Graduate. And they're just an example of how fascinated uh, we, we, we humans are uh, story loving humans are with how how it work, how love works how 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 conflict erupts into the area of romance and the lover demonstrates that to perfection because we've got we've got the triangle there between the three people tugging at war tugging at each other maybe the person in the middle not, not knowing quite what to do here is a very, very good example, one of my favourite examples, and I think an absolutely classic split person triangle um, from a film called A Place in the Sun, starring uh, Montgomery Cliff. He plays a character called George Eastman, who um, is not okay inside, compulsively goes into a relationship with a lady called Alice, played by Shelley Winters up there. Opposite, the other uh, heroine in, in this story, played by, anybody recognise that? Liz Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor, that's right. Beautifully played by 80 year old Elizabeth Taylor. Um, and he is, he, he is very much split, like any of us can be, um, between two different choices. And, well, first he falls for Alice, because he's very young, and because she comes along at that moment when he's, he's single and he wants to, to be in love, to have a girlfriend. But it's a rather bad timing, because not long afterwards, guess who comes into his life? The ravishing and high, highly appointed um, socialite, played by beautiful Liz Taylor. And he compulsively, on the inside, driven by want, by desire, he falls for Angela, which leaves him having to decide how, what to do about his first relationship. Um, can he do anything about it? I ask myself. Given that he is so identified on the inside, could he possibly rescue himself on the outside? There's a very, there's a beautiful moment early in the film where we see that identification, <coughs> the inner, the inner manifesting itself, the inner tug between two different um, possibilities. <coughs>
for synchronicity anyway, to have just fallen for one lady and the lady of his life turns up next. Um, Johnny Depp, famous, I don't know if it's famous, but it's a quote. If you love two people at the same time, choose the second one. Because if you really love the first one, you wouldn't have fallen for the second one. Now, would that have worked in the case of uh, George Eastman? Bearing in mind how, what would have happened? Bearing in mind, like I said, how, how convolutedly tied he tied up and identified he was on the inside. And indeed, would it have worked in this case? Maybe it did work, but was it the right thing to happen? Should it have happened? The betrayal of Christ by Judas. Should Judas have betrayed Christ, who was his first, his first royalty? Or should he have gone to the, uh, the priests and handed him over for 30 pieces of silver, yeah? which was the second choice facing him? He was a split person, one of the archetypes of split, split people. Um, and the mystics would say, well, relax. Judas, or whoever you are, if anybody calls <coughs> you a Judas because you betrayed somebody, relax. You can't make a wrong choice. It wasn't your decision to make. You are not in control. Your life belongs to source. You are source. There's nothing else but source, life, the ultimate.